Welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Hey guys, welcome back to Integrated. My name is Angela Erickson, and today I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, I'm actually talking to now journalist Stephen Cox about his new book. Um, it's, a, it's a handbook for holiness for those of you who are maybe familiar with um, St. Alphonsus Liguori. This is really a, a guidebook for those of us in the modern age. So thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be here. And it's been so long since we've connected, Angela. I know, and, I know. Uh, it's great to see you. <laughs> it's so much fun. And it's fun to talk to you in this capacity. Um, yeah. For those of you maybe who don't know, I used to work for LifeSite News, which is um, the outlet that Stephen primarily does journalism for and, and writes for. At the time, you were not a journalist for LifeSite News. You were you were doing more marketing and, and weren't you kind of like an editor why do I remember talking to you so much? I was doing development work and I talked to you a lot. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're so small at life. Yeah. Say, it's not that <laughs> anymore. Now, now, yeah. now we have over 70, I think. No um, way. That's crazy. Yeah, we have yeah. like we just, maybe we just 30. The, yeah, I know. That's uh, well, a stretch. I, I don't I don't think there were 30. That's me being extremely liberal. Well, when I started, it was 2017. It was myself. And one other person, um, Rebecca Roberts, in the marketing department. And it was just two. And now I, we had nine last year. I don't know where we're at now, but um, wow. it's a great blessing. And yeah, I think I was doing like uh, fundraising emails, probably. I think, You're probably for, helping for, us with those, like maybe headlines or something for those. Yeah. Because yeah, that, that the, always the fundraising campaigns, that was quite the... Uh, quite the ordeal every few months, you know? So yeah, it was just, it's just so fun to talk to you now and be like, you're an author, you're, you're an <laughs> author and you were doing marketing yeah. before last time I, I knew you. So um, would you mind maybe telling uh, any of our listeners who, who maybe are Catholic, are converts, maybe mm -hmm. even fallen away, why you wrote, um, why you wrote this book, St. Alphonsus for the 21st Century, A Handbook for Holiness? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a question I'm getting a lot from everybody. Um, I think the short end of it is because I was in that boat uh, at one point. I was, I had been a fallen away Catholic. I stopped praying. I stopped going to mass in my early twenties, despite being raised in the in, in going to diocesan Catholic schools. Um, and you know, it was probably a combination of things why I just you know went the way I did. Um, they're in the book. You'll have to read to find out. Um, but I really think it comes down to wanting to um, help other people uh, understand the truths of our faith. I mean, the St. Alphonsus founded the Redemptorist Order in the 1730s um, for the most abandoned souls, those who were in the Italian countryside, who were, I mean, more or less kind of forgotten, even by the clergy. Um, and he set his life's goal to preach to them. And the Redemptorists started out with less than a half dozen um, aspirants, uh, and their membership has grown throughout the entire world um, since then. And so when I started first reading his writings, especially on the priesthood, especially about mm -hmm. prayer and silence, and the entire gamut of, of all of the, the aspects of, of our faith, um, the scales just fell from my eyes. I was in my late twenties at the time, still sort of stuck in second gear with, with my, with my faith. I had never even heard of the Latin mass, I think at the time. And, um, despite having, I worked for the Archdiocese of Chicago in my early twenties in grad school when I went to school oh, at Loyola. Interesting. Uh, back then it was Cardinal George. So it was, it wasn't like it is now right. with the current uh, occupant. Um, so there was a bit, it was a bit more sane, uh, uh, at the time, but, um, still, there was a lot of, apparently, room to grow in my faith. And St. Alphonsus kind of put me on that trajectory. And I think, in short, it's a way of giving back to him, but also trying to reach, you know, and ask myself, where was, was I, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago? Um, and what would I want to know about the faith? And really, you know, where are, are people I still know, friends, families, and others who who who, who aren't coming to Mass, who, who, who you know, just isn't clicking spiritually? Mm. So Parts of the book I kind of wrote for certain individuals who probably when they read it will recognize, oh, he's talking to me. So oh, that's funny. Um, I think it's a it's a good thing. So that's that's why I wanted to to I think re reintroduce in Alphonsus um, to to the church today. So I I have to ask like which works maybe in 
influenced you the most here. Caitlin Smith says I read conformity with divine will and that it's a, it's a pretty short book. Um, did that have an impact on you? Did, was it one of the first things that maybe you read that sort of got you hooked on St. Alphonsus Liguori? Um, I have read uh, what, what Caitlin said there as well. Um, it is one of the shorter, more digestible ones. And to be honest, all, all of St. Alphonsus writings are pretty digestible. He's eminently readable. Um, in fact, he said one time, um, he preached every sermon he preached. He did not give one that would not have been understood by this, the little old lady in, in the back of the church. And so he instructed mm -hmm. his priests to preach very simple. Um, I would say though, the one that really changed me the most was his writings on the priesthood. It was one of the first, um, ones I came across his book, the dignities and duties of the priest, um, mm -hmm. is, is, I mean, they're all this thick Angela. So all of his writings are very big. Um, he composed them with, you know, assistance, obviously no one, and he didn't start writing until he was in his mid forties, to be honest. He, wow. He, um, yeah. So he wrote until he was 90. Well, he died when he was 91. He's actually considered like one of if not the best selling authors of all time because of the number of books he wrote it was over a hundred, like pamphlets, treatises, things like that. And, you know, they've been translated to so many different languages and uh, published different volumes. But for me, it was the priesthood and two things kind of stood out real quick was one, he said, priests are greater than the angels and Mary. Oh, interesting. That's, that's a pretty big praise. That's a bold okay. statement. Any, any, do you have any ideas as to why that might be? Probably because they are um, given the grace to act in persona Christi and to be new Christ's. That would be my guess. And to yeah. affect grace through the sacraments like that and, and yeah. the ability to forgive sins. Um yeah in that capacity. Am, am I like, tracking? That, you got it. That's it. He said, oh, because the forgiving, forgetting, uh, forgiving, um, sins in the confessional, Mary, Mary could, could not do that. Um, she, yeah. was not given that power and the angels can't do that. So the priest frees a sin, a soul from, from sin and snare to the devil. So they, they open the gates of heaven. And, and I never, never realized the beauty of confession in that way. When I, mm. even growing up again, I, I was raised in, in, in the, the diocesan, uh, churches. And um, uh, secondly, was was what he says about the mass: is the priests offer an infinite worship of their, their their worship is of infinite value when they when they mm -hmm. offer the mass and and give uh, the body and blood of Christ to souls in in the sacrament of the of the Eucharist, and um, that is uh, something um, only only men only priests can can do. And so um, there's a saying I forget which one I, I put it in the book. I think it might have been Saint Francis. Uh, and I forget which one of them, but he said, if I saw a priest or an angel, I would kneel to the priest because of mm -hmm. the, the grandeur of their, well, of their and, and that's part of what Satan hates about humanity, right? Is that we have been elevated despite our lower intellectual nature yeah. and uh, our frailty, honestly. And in, in that, I just think of St. Paul saying that uh, um, for our weak um, God makes our weaknesses perfect, right? Like that's basically what he's saying in our weakness. God makes us perfect. Um, when we are yeah. attuned and conform to his divine will, um, he's able to do that. So what are the things like the biggest takeaways that you want readers to come away with when they, when they are reading your book? Um, I love yeah. that you sort of condensed it for the modern Catholic only because I mean, for me as a mom, for example, I just don't have time to read these really lengthy books. Um, I don't have as much time, but also I think practically speaking, the modern mind is not accustomed to reading these, these more dense books. And so I could see a lot of people finding his works and saying, you know, this is really interesting, but they just get burned out with it and they never finish it. That's exactly right. I mean, that was the way I felt. I mean, I, I can't tell you. I mean, my books now, they have like no binding. And they, it's all highlighted yellow. I personally yeah. tend to do that with my books. And it was just that way for, for many years. And, and you know, I mean, so I just kept gobbling up as much as I could. And I said, there's no no way other people could do this. And and I said, OK, I have to condense it as best as possible. And that's not an easy task either, because then you have to ask right. yourself, well, what's most relevant? And there's a lot of prayer involved in that, a lot of... um. Like I said, writing to my former self, how did this apply? What stood out here in St. Alphonsus' teachings that, you know, I could, that I, that I couldn't find elsewhere. I mean, there's a million, there's right. thousands of spiritual writers in the church. Um, you know, why St. Alphonsus? Um, I think for me, the one thing I hope people take away from it, uh, especially is prayer um, and how to pray better. 
Mm, and if you're not yeah. praying, you know, the reasons why you should pray and um, silence. Um, so, so, so for the lay people uh, who, who, who are either fallen away Catholics um, watching this program or who, who are Catholics and want to learn how to pray better um, and how to attend mass better and get more benefits out of it. Just general spiritual advancement would be, I think, a great a great thing that would happen from this. Um, the later chapters, the Blessed Sacrament, Religious Life, I would hope that um, St. Alphonsus, if he were to read this book today, he'd endorse it, but also be very happy with the chapter I wrote on religious life and the priesthood, especially yeah. because, I mean, he founded a redemptorist order. That's it's a priestly order. Um, he had so much to say about the priesthood. We can talk about it in, in a few minutes, but yeah. Um, he helped priests become holier. Um, he, he laid down his life. Interesting fact, um, he didn't be, enter religious life or he didn't enter seminary until he was 27. He was actually a lawyer uh, until, you know, throughout his entire young adult life. And mm. it wasn't until a crisis following a lawsuit where he was um, involved in a multi-million dollar today, uh, today's dollars, um, land dispute involving the Grand Duke of Tuscany and the Medici legal team and all this intrigue. Oh, yeah. And I was going to say, you get the Medici family in there. That's uh, quite the ordeal. Problematic, to say the least. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you better so be there, careful. So there's potential. There, There is belief that the judge was bribed and Alphonsus, knowing that his case was airtight, in, 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 uh, assumed there had something been uh, untoward that had happened with the case. And mm. um that you know when he when he um realized the injustice of the court system that, that justice is fleeting even in this world there's not perfect justice he he said i'm going to um uh, give myself to god and, and and this is what what god wants from me so he was totally turned off from his profession after that humiliating defeat and said mm. okay god I, I give it i give it all back all, all, all is vain so yeah so i hope those are two things you know yeah. people can improve their prayer life and understand sin especially too but it, i think religious you know, clergy priests bishops um if they were to read it i really think they would benefit a lot yeah that. let's talk about that because yeah. i think we are seeing i i don't like to spend so much time focusing on the crisis in, in the church right now mm -hmm. uh, there are enough people doing that that i don't mm -hmm. i don't feel like that's necessarily my role in this space but i do think it's important to examine it from time to time. And there's just no doubt that um, our priests are suffering. Like the church is suffering. There is mm -hmm. sort of this fatherlessness going on, even with mm -hmm. the priesthood. I sort of talked about this a little bit with Devin Shatt when I interviewed him a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, because the fatherlessness problem is not just one in, in sort of that biological context within the family and in the domestic home, the domestic mm -hmm. church, but also in a spiritual level. And we, that became profoundly clear during the last set of COVID lockdowns when our churches were closed and, and priests totally absconded from the sacraments out of fear, but it persists. Mm -hmm. And like, if, if you were a priest today, what things do you think would be the most convicting for you um, coming from St. Alphonsus? Because I think we both probably would agree St. Alphonsus would have some very strong language um, for the state of the church today. Yeah, and and just real quick, he he would write thousands of letters to people who would correspond to him, basically the, the equivalent of emails today. And he wow. he responded in 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 a very kind fashion. His letters and personal correspondences were always very kind, patient, but also firm on the church and what it what needed to happen. But he said at the time, the church is in a state of relaxation and confusion. If you, even in his own time, seventeen thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, and you know we wow. tend to think everything in the past is is much better. But um, I think he would probably say, well, you know, there's he, he did write to certain nuns too. Um, f fun fact, actually, a nun um, was actually responsible for the founding of the Redemptress. So we can get into that in a, in a moment. Oh, yeah. Um, but so Are he you saying of, women do good things in the church? Hmm, who, who would have thought, you know? <laughs> yeah. Apart from thought? Our Lady, what are you saying right now? This yeah, is heterodoxy. Yeah, of course. You are furthermore but... anathematized. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, such a confusion is that, yeah, the, you know, the, the thought is that, that, that sisters and nuns don't contribute anything to the church. But in this case, God, God used a particular one to, to mm -hmm. found the Redemptorist, basically. Um, to, to answer your question, I would say, uh, I'll, I'll read a couple of brief quotes. Um, 
here's here's one. The good morals and the salvation of the people depend on good pastors. If there is a good priest in charge of the parish, you will so soon see devotion flourishing and people frequenting the sacraments. Hence the proverb, like pastor, like parish. It's obvious, you know, that, yeah. that what's happening here in the church that, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not happening. Um, you know, when, when, when laity are, I don't know what the, the, the statistics are off my off top of my head, but how many Catholics today, you know, support um, uh, homosexual unions and, you know, abortion and have cohabitated and, you and know, don't even believe these... in the real presence of the Holy Eucharist, which is the source and summit of the Christian life. I mean, you get down to the most fundamental aspects. And yeah, yeah you're that's totally it. right. That's I... it. So, so he says um, to just continue on. Thanks for the, the, the comment uh, from the traditional Catholic. I agree with that. Um, St. Alphonsus would say that the church is, is, is filled with, with people who, who aren't, you know, believing and upholding the right things. Uh, he would say, though, to, to, to priests, he says, priests should behave without affectation, severity, fastidiousness, and should always wear the cassock. Angela, I think that's so important. That's, as the kids time. say, that's so based. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so obvious. It's like, it's like, hey, this is your state in life, you know. But like the, in the every profession, you have a uniform. Right. And that exactly. helps people yeah. see who you are. I mean, very clearly. I mean, I'm always very confused when I see priests mm -hmm. who are not wearing the Roman collar or I see I actually get confused when I see Lutheran pastors wearing the Roman collar, too, because mm -hmm. um, like I, I could see people accidentally going up to them and saying, can you hear my confession? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So you get the yeah. you get the whole outfit with the cassock and everything. There is absolutely yeah. no confusion that that is a yeah. Catholic priest. Yeah, it's it's so needed in these times. And and Saint Alphonsus again, he when he when he became a priest at thirty, so he only did three years of study and actually studied at his father's house. So back then, the, it wasn't at least in the Naples area, it wasn't as robust like a like a strict sound seminary. And 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 to be honest, he probably didn't need too much formation. He in his youth, and he got canon and civil law degrees when he was sixteen. In his twenties, like he belonged to various lay groups, so wow. he he was very well sound on on a lot of. Thing. So he he got ordained at thirty, but he came up with like a sort of bullet point list of like ten or twelve. Um, I think I think it's around that. Um, basically, just vows, you know, to say, uh, here's what I'm going to be. And a couple of them mentioned, you know, I I have to be as pure as the angels. If I if I'm above mm -hmm. the angels in dignity, I have to do that. And so he would he would say um, and write that you know, priests need to give up their amusements, their their preferences, their tastes. They need to do fasting, not only um, exterior mortifications with the body i mean he, he actually wore like a chain around his neck when he ate uh he would put bitter herbs on his food to you know to deny his palate mm. uh, pleasure um but he would also discipline his body throughout throughout his life and so you know he he understood the the priesthood as a total crucifixion it, it, i don't think if he was around today he'd be doing half the things that that that, that the clergy are doing today with um you know, all the sorts of things. I mean, I don't think he would be watching football on Sundays after mass. I'm not seeing a lot of mm -hmm. priests do that, but you know, yeah. he understood the line between, okay, I'm doing this for, for just a sort of um, a leisure. Uh, you can go for a walk. He would often encourage his seminarians to go for walks um, to, you know, to, to relax and not always talk about serious stuff, but you know, in his youth, he actually went to the theater a lot. Um, he was an av avid card player hmm. Um just with friends, nothing, nothing yeah. serious. But um, he he put those things away when he became a priest. He knew it was a total uh, a self uh, denial. And, That's and really said, interesting yes. because that happens too. It's so funny to hear this coming from you because as a parent, you do the same thing mm -hmm. because you don't have time. Your 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 yeah. life is centered on your children. <laughs> Great timing, Veronica. Wow. Right. Um, <laughs> like almost everything. And this is where a lot of moms, for example, feel like, well, I've lost myself. I've lost my identity. And yet not so in my mind. I mean, you could feel mm. that way if, if you have a very worldly mindset. Mm. And that's hard. Like you're dying so much to yourself. But of course, yeah. it's an opportunity to reclaim your true identity in your vocation, yeah. which is what we are supposed to do. And so you're dying to those parts of yourself. Like I don't get to go snowboarding all the time, for example. That was something I love to do. I still love it. Um, but I can, it's been years. Actually, the last time I went snowboarding was when I worked for LifeSite News over five years ago. <laughs> Um, on one of my really? retreat days, that's what I did on one of my retreat days. I went and I snowboarded and I prayed. 
Um, mm. because that's where mm. I, I just feel, I feel so connected to God, um, in a, in a very profound way when I'm out and mm -hmm. doing stuff like that, you know, where it's quiet and I can think by myself and be with God mm. in nature. Um, mm. how, how do you think then like, Catholics can encourage their priests. I mean, first of all, they should get their priests your handbook, maybe. Um, <laughs> but but how do we encourage our priests to be better spiritual fathers at, at such a time as this? Well, I, th I think just with with general support and not just um, prayers, um, mm -hmm. with actual um, support. I mean, you have have dinner with your priests. Have them over to the house um, after mass. Talk to them. I mean, they're individuals. M many, unfortunately, today don't live in community. Mm -hmm. um are they're, they're, they're solitary individuals and that's yeah. a very can, can be a lonely life oh yeah um and i think i think too um i, I i'll you know the, each priest has to have some sort of apostolic mission i mean some of some are university professors and and, and some are parish priests some are uh authors uh some do different things and i think when they do something good or, or even if, if, you know, especially if you can help them in that area. So if you're someone who's into politics, you know, your priest um, likes reading about current events or something, you know, say, you know, hey, Father, you know, we have a, we have a commonality here. Let's hold a, a, a workshop at the church. I mean, when I, a couple of years ago, we had a, a priest at our chapel. And on Saturdays, he would coordinate what, are, what he called Days of Doctrine. And I would go and give a talk about various things. The Americanism is something I'm interested in. Mm and um just current events in general but uh so you know there there's things you can float to priests i think um when uh it depends on their, their preference right i mean it, it's different for everybody um mm -hmm. some priests do want to be kind of left alone and maybe that's their own project i have a priest um, like that you know so, <laughs> yeah. hey you know so not all of them always want mm -hmm. uh, you, you asking but you know it'll depend on, on different things but um so yeah. Mary here is asking, wasn't Al St. Alphonsus badly crippled by arthritis in his older years? Is that true? Yes. Yeah. So he actually received the last rites on, on more than several occasions. Um, hmm. he, he was actually appointed bishop um, against his will. He very much did not want to be bishop at, at the age That's of- That's always a uh, good he, sign, actually. He was in his 60s. Yeah. He, he, he had led his congregation for decades. And- um, uh, he, when he did though, he did do a lot of, of great good and he actually pushed, um, Eucharistic adoration a lot more and opened his up, his church up to the people. But yeah, he suffered a lot in his later life. He, he did have a hunched neck where it's believed his, his neck was so malformed that it was cutting into his, his, his upper uh, chest. Wow. And so he was confined, yeah, to a, a wheelchair as well. Um, he's the patron of, of arthritis sufferers. So pray mm. to him. And actually interesting, if, if you do buy it, um, in the back, there's uh, prayers to St. Alphonsus. So prayers he composed himself mm. and then novenas and other prayers that I found from others, um, uh, mostly priests uh, who prayed who pray to him. So I thought wow. that was a good addition to have at the end. So he knew, he knew to offer up all of that. Uh, Our Lady was at his death. He was devoted to Mary, Our Lady of Perpetual help is actually um, hmm. the patron of the Redemptorist Order. Um, so yeah, so he he knew physical suffering, what that all entailed, and he writes about that in the first um, in in his writings on on love of God is that to offer up our ailments and to be content with the health we have and to not obsess as so many oh, yeah. uh, fitness people do. And I I go to the gym. I need to be healthy because I have some digestive issues and and work out. I have to work out or yeah. I have various symptoms. But um, he, he would very much, I think, be against this sort of bodybuilding, you know, obsession with the, with the body uh, that we have today uh, too much. So, you know, that's really interesting because I've been I've been talking about this as well with friends and family of mine. I have an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. and it impacts every aspect of my life. Uh, but it hasn't been until probably the last few years that I realized, oh, I could do something about this a little bit to alleviate my symptoms and maybe even heal my body. But you're mm -hmm. right. There is it's it, it can be dangerous not not to seek healing, but to make an idol of it. And I think yeah. so many are prone to that because we love to look for that perpetual fountain of youth because we yeah. want innately eternal life and health, which is what we were made for. But we're made for it in heaven, not yeah in this fallen world. That's so it's, interesting. I'm only really familiar with his preparation for death and it's amazing. 
it's an amazing I, book but yeah it's just so i was amazing. just gonna mention that yeah because because he says he says actually about death he says the the death of a saint is not it's not death it's sleep mm -hmm. and he says the at those last moments um he said he uses the analogy he says when christ was on the cross they they offered him 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 wine to drink but he he denied it and saint alphonsus says um uh, the, use the last moments of your life, uh, especially to to offer that up to Christ and say, I, I will suffer and endure this. And I, when I first read that, and I put this little um, insight in the book, I said, how many times when in our age now, where hospice workers or others will, will come and say, well, your grandpa is almost there. Let's make him comfortable. And I don't think, I think I, I'm convinced um, in fact, that San Francisco would oppose that. He would say, no, dying tranquilized by numbing agents and things like this. That's not how Christ died. Christ wanted to feel and offer up every aspect of that suffering for us. And San Francisco says we need to return the same thing. So I think that's such a good insight for the modern age, especially. Yeah. And I, 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 I yeah. I I've posited that. the same thought actually and and it's hard too because we're younger we're not of course, we're not yeah. watching our loved yeah. ones die so i mean i yeah. i want to be sensitive to that but at the yeah. same time i do think that when we cut short someone else's suffering um you know maybe we're actually denying them a chance to work out the purgation that they would experience and you know after they their body dies um, maybe we're denying them an opportunity to offer up that suffering and instead now they're going to be in purgatory longer because we denied them an opportunity to offer that suffering now um, and I think that's something worth thinking about um, yeah it's easy to say I, I I've said it before but um, I and I can only hope that that God my guardian angel Mary when when that day happens I'll have the strength and courage to face it that way yeah um, but that's I share the exact same sentiments so yeah, that's really, that's just such a great point. I'm glad that you brought that up. So I kind of wanted to um, turn to maybe a little bit more about um, what types of specific things do you maybe encourage? I, I don't want to give it all away because it's the point of the book, but like about prayer, what, what are a couple of tips that you have for people to pray well? Because this is something I also, I talked to Dan Burke about it a few months ago. And I think it's something we need to revisit often because as St. Alphonsus himself says, um, you actually won't get to heaven unless you, you engage in meditative prayer often. Um, and I think we as Catholics, sometimes we just, we go through our rote prayers without actually bringing the mind and the imagination into it. We're, we're marking it off of our checklist sometimes with the rosary, uh, but we're not having meaningful conversation with God. And so what, what are some tips that maybe St. Alphonsus has for us that really encourage us to engage more? Yeah, so I had a little hard time hearing you. I think you're oh, asking I'm about so prayer, sorry. prayer and, uh, um, or what was it exactly? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So what are some tips that St. Alphonsus would have for us to engage in mental prayer? Because he he tells us that, you know, we're, we're not going to make it to heaven unless we ha engage in meditative prayer. And sometimes I feel like as Catholics, we, send a, we go through our rote prayers throughout the day without engaging the imagination and the intellect. Um, mm -hmm more more on a deep level so can you explain maybe a couple tips i don't want to give everything away because i want people to buy your book yeah um you know i've always said and, and other saints i've read have said that prayer is oxygen for the soul and uh, now find this i think would agree with that <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> she wants to play with my uh, mixer <laughs> oh yeah so exciting but yeah so so saint Alphonse does say um, 15 minutes in Eucharistic adoration does you more good than almost any other form of prayer you can, you can do because spending time alone with our Lord physically there with the blessed sacrament, uh, that's that you're face to face with the creator of the universe. And that's such a generous thing our Lord does for us. So, um, he was a big, big advocate of spending time in front of adoration, uh, the blessed sacrament in adoration. So first point, if you have a local adoration chapel, uh, if there isn't one, uh, you know, ask your priest. That'd be a good thing for our priest to get in the habit of making more frequent visits to the, 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 the Blessed Sacrament instead of making frequent visits to our televisions. We should sit in front of Christ, right? So, so first simple point. Um, St. Alphonsus says silence also is essential for prayer. 
you know, I've said in other interviews about this book that you can't be friends with someone you don't talk to. How often are we speaking with God? Um, and St. Alphonsus says we have to shut out all earthly inclinations. And that includes, you know, cell phones, um, friends, uh, movies. We have to find somewhere in our daily lives um, to use the time we've been given. Again, St. Alphonsus actually says time is a great treasure. He, he actually comments on time and its importance. Um, he says you have to find time if you can. Uh, because some people, it's very difficult. Like like yourself, Angela, I can imagine with, with all the kids. It's time. Yeah, yeah there's hard. seasons I, I almost feel like I never get to pray. And then I feel bad when I go to bed at night. And I sort of have to remind myself that as long as I'm, I don't know, maybe this is wrong. And you can tell me, but sometimes I just think, you know, I, at this stage, especially if I'm up all night with a newborn or something, and my kids are rolling me out of bed to to feed them breakfast, and then I'm passing out uh, after cleaning the kitchen late at night, um, mm. that calling and reminding myself even of God's presence, that is that is beneficial, and that that is a type of prayer. It's sort of like the what does St. Francis de Sales call it? Like um, it's like the flower, right? And you revisit it throughout the day. Ooh. Yeah. She's playing with my dial. <laughs> I'm revisiting it, and uh, yeah. and and that's sometimes as much as I can do. Well, that Saint Saint Alphonsus agrees with that. He says if you need time, if you can't focus, let's say, um, if you can't meditate, because meditation is kind of hard for some people too. I didn't know how to meditate when I first tried it. Um, use a book, or or just you know you can you can shout what, what he calls an ejaculatory prayer, just something short, five ten seconds long. You know, Lord, thank you for this day. Help me to, to continue to get through it and with, with gratitude for you. Something as simple as that, right? That's that's a prayer. Um, I think, you know, for especially for busy people, um, St. Alphonsus talks about the solitude of the heart. It's not just a matter of, you know, going into the, the countryside, right? You can't leave your children behind while you're off, you know, in the middle of nowhere in solitude. Um, he does speak about solitude of the heart. And that's, I think, what you just mentioned there is, you know, Although I'm amid this chaotic day, it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, there's still things to do. Um, it's that interior peace and it's that interior union with God. And St. Alphonsus says, you know, focus on that, meditate on that as best you can. Pick something out of, pick something out of scripture, pick something about, out of any book. Yeah. Five or ten minutes, just at a minimum um, to, to do and, and to glean something from that. Um, that's yeah. Great, you know? I think it's this is one of those reasons why it's so important to have a lot of Catholic art in your home so that if you need something to meditate on and you don't have time to maybe open your Bible that day or something and you're having a tough time considering what to meditate on, find an icon or some beautiful artwork in your home and look at it when you're passing by and take some time considering it. It's This is part of having a, a, an Ecclesia Domestica, or is it a Domestica Ecclesia? I always get it mixed up of what, the, whether, what order it's supposed to be in, but um, mm -hmm. that's a part of it. And I think that is that bears fruit even, even when you feel like, maybe like I do, like I, I'm never doing enough. And even this, have you ever heard of the Holy Apost or the Apostolate of Holy Motherhood? Have you heard of that? I'm just talking uh, about no, it with everybody no, now. Interesting. Okay, so it's a whole apostolate. I want to do a full-blown show on it. I want to interview Dr. Mir Miravalli on it. Um, I just, I want everyone to know about it. But even in the visions that this young mom had, she was a 30-year-old, 33-year-old mom or something, or 36, and three small children. And Our Lady was coming to her and Jesus often for a span of time, like a couple months or something, almost daily. But even when her children would start to act up, our lady would tell her to go tend to her children hmm. um, because that's her vocation. And, and even hmm. Jesus would begin sometimes to show up in, an, in a vision. And there, there's a description one time of her child all of a sudden hurting himself, one of her kiddos. Hmm. And Jesus hmm. goes away so she can tend to him. And hmm. it's this reminder that, you know, they are our, our children, for those of us who are parents and, and watching this, when our children need us, they need us. And God knows that. It's not like he, he, mm -hmm. God is looking at you and being like, well, you're neglecting me right now. He's going, I gave you these kids. You have to take care of them. You have to tend right. to their needs. Um, right. And he's not going to spite you because of that. Um, <clears throat> right. So that's just another thing that I thought was so interesting because I have a tendency when I'm like, no, this is my prayer time. I'm protecting my prayer time. And my, yeah. kid, my kids maybe need me. Um, and, and instead I need to go, maybe now's not the right time. I need to. Yeah. Engage Let, my vocation. Let's pick up that, on that in a second because Santa Claus actually writes about parenting and especially um, 
uh, the duties of parents towards their children. Um, he had a, he actually had a kind of um, very tenuous relationship with his own father. So let's, let's pick hmm. over that in a second because I want to make this first point that um, what you said about icons and, and beauty in the home. Um, Saint Alphonsus was actually a, a, a painter. He he created art, and he, hmm. he not only created art. Um, I don't include them in the book. I I, I should have. Um, he he composed hymns and and songs. So he he wrote over fifty. So he's um, just like an amazing melody. human being. All around. I mean, he again, civil canon law degrees at 16. He was trained with private tutors. Um, he, 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 he drew sort of a sort of amateur architect of sorts. Um, and it, it came from, uh, again, we can get into the family thing now. Um, his, his father, his father was the captain of, of, uh, of the Royal galleys. So he was like a very, the top ranking naval officer. And his mother was uh, a Spanish uh, woman, Anna Catherine Cavalieri. They had uh, eight children. The youngest died in infancy. Alphonsus was the oldest. And uh, not only himself, but but two of his brothers went into religious life. One became a Benedictine. Uh, two of his sisters became nuns. And then his, his youngest sister and then his youngest brother named Hercules. Okay. What? Um, That's he, wild. He, yeah, what? yeah, interesting. And he, he entered the married state. And they actually corresponded later in life, throughout life. And um, they were very close. And so, so he was raised with a lot of this pressure, uh, in a sense, to perform in this legal career that his father set out for him. Mm. And uh, he, he did in almost every way. He was renowned throughout the country. And again, it was this famous court case where there was bribery and things um, that put him back on the path. But um, he, he did write a lot about parenting and families and uh, as well as again, religious, religious um, women, women religious. So we can talk about either of those if, if you want. Oh yeah, and all of it. A lot Let's of just talk about everything. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So what did he have to say about parenting? Because one thing that I love about this apostolate of holy motherhood, as Our Lady says, um, in in one of these visions. Now this this book has an imprimatur, like the church. It's obviously not required to believe for salvation, but um, these claims, these visions, have been thoroughly investigated and the church approved of them. It's, it's actually very orthodox, probably one of the most orthodox things that I've read mm -hmm. in terms of revelation in quite some time. Um, and these revelation or these visions happened in the 1980s. So it's pretty new actually. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, she says that the neglect of children is probably one of the worst spiritual offenses that has been committed against ch children in destroying their innocence because mm -hmm. our children are the closest to <clears throat> being like Christ in their innocence. And so when we harm our children or neglect them spiritually, it is extremely egregious and an offense to God. And, uh, and there's just so much of it. It's so pervasive today. And Our Lady is asking mothers to to combat this and pray against um these evils that are happening to our children specifically and i thought that's just so profound to look at our children children and realize like yes in their innocence uniquely they are like christ being spotless as lambs yeah well i mean this i i absolutely agree with that i think it, it's all the more made worse when you think about like transgenderism and the, yes. the total corruption of of the young person who who doesn't, who can't think straight yet, yep. um, who, who probably, I would suspect, this is my own theory, that a lot of these young, like transitioning children um, before like 15, 16 years old, they might probably not be baptized, especially probably not confirmed. Yeah. So, th so they're still under the influence of original sin of the devil without having been dispossessed of that, which is mm -hmm. why we need, we need baptism so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a total corruption, isn't it? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just pure evil. And I think St. Alphonse said, actually, he, he said, normally speaking, one of every three children have a vocation to, to either religious life, to the priesthood, to, to the convent. So, I mean, you think about that. <clears throat> how many, how many uh, people uh, are raising their children to be future priests, future nuns? Again, I'm childless. I, I, I'm in my late 30s, so I, I'm, I'm not helping with that situation. Uh, but <laughs> Shame on think you. About no, I'm it. just kidding. I'm sure it's all your <laughs> fault. <laughs> but no, that's a lot of uh, potential um, uh, vocations, you know, especially, you know, when, when people are only having one or two kids and, oh, I need to have my vacation home. I can't afford that. Right. It, it's, it's it, again, I'm speaking from my position. I'm not in a position to judge, but 
um, it, there's a lot of souls that could be saved if we had big families and mm -hmm. you know, good children that were raising in the faith and not in sports and things so much. So yeah, having our priorities straight. So what does he say then uh, to parent, like to parents? How does he instruct them, um, especially in in light of maybe those this tenuous relationship that he had with his own father? <clears throat> yeah, so um, it actually it turned out well for for his father. Um, he although he was just quite ambitious and wanted his son to to succeed and, and to have you know a good successful life, um, despite the resistance early on and even during his early apostolate. Um, when he became a priest, St. Alphonsus' father, Don Joseph Liguori, uh, later in life uh, admitted, you know, he said, I, I uh, basically apologize for, for that. And uh, mm -hmm. you've chosen a holy vocation in life. And I'm, I'm glad God sent you to, to, the, to the priesthood and through our family. And so he died in a state of um, good reputation. It wasn't anything that would have uh, imperiled his, his soul. But um, I think it shows the example um, of sort of sometimes the the problems that can maybe arise when you're putting too much pressure on your children. And so, so San Alphonsus actually says parents who hinder or dissuade their child from a potential vocation have, it's a double sin. One is against charity. The other is against piety. And it's the obligation mm -hmm. of parents, he says, to help the temporal and spiritual well-being of their children. And so any parent, he actually quotes Origen, who is, a, I think, an early church father. Um, he says, Origen says, that parents will be held accountable or will be judged for the sins of their children. Kind of a frightening thought. Wow. Um, so if you think about that, you know, you, you, there's a lot of pressure um, in, in a good sense, right? Because parents are the stand-ins for, for God and, 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 and for Mary, in a sense, um, uh, to, to raise their children. So he, he does say, um, again, one in three children, normally speaking, have a vocation. Um, he mm -hmm. says parents, especially fathers, um, yes, uh, traditional Thomas, uh, parents uh, to live as close as possible to a religious life. He, 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 his own mother, again, was very pious. She raised primarily the children. And um, uh, she every morning would, would, would um, gather the children uh, and at night um, and, again, inspire in them Thanksgiving for seeing them through the day, having mm -hmm. them offer up uh, and be mindful of the fact that everything they do throughout the day is for the glory of God, their thoughts, words, actions, and deeds. Um, St. Alphonsus says, if the father is going to mass, uh, practicing good habits, um, being virtuous, praying the rosary, then the children will do the same because he says, and this is a quote, children are like apes. They do as what they see. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so they, they are mine. <laughs> it's very true, I, you know. So it, it's all of what you would expect any saint to say about parents, you know. You're going to have to, teach them the, the piety uh, of living a Christian life, take them to mass. Don't um, put them into any occasions of sin. Uh, mm -hmm. He says also remove bad books um, from the home. So, you know, um, I think you could say remove bad technologies, remove bad 100%. social, social yes. media apps from the home, you know, take away that cell phone. Um, he says those are just mediums of temptation and sin. So he does have remarks from mothers as well, but um, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on, on that so far. So he's, he, he really covers everything. Again, he's a doctor of the church, yeah. Angela. He hasn't, he hasn't yeah. missed much. So. Yeah, no, I mean, all of this comports with everything I already believe. So, I mean, I, I don't feel like I can add much to it ex or, or challenge it, obviously. It seems very common sense to me. Um, so, but I would love to hear what he has to say from others, of course. F selfishly, I would, I would love to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he actually, um, a couple of things. He, 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 he wrote, writes, again, wrote thousands of letters to, to, to young people who inquired to him about vocations, etc. And, and to several young women who, who write to him, he says, uh, look at the state of, of married women. He says that the, the whole day is completely filled with, with children, with their husband, with, with in-laws, all these sorts of things and tasks. It's very difficult, as, as you admitted earlier, to find time to pray. And he says, it's hard for these souls to stay close to God. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And he says, imagine how much more you uh, love it for God and closest to God you'll have in the convent when you're praying all day. He said, he, he predicted, he said, if you, more young women understood the beauty of convents, 
the whole world would become a monastery. And, I and, and, agree with this statement as a married woman um, with, with five small children, because I went on a silent retreat earlier this year and I didn't want to leave. I felt bad. I was like, I yeah. love you guys, but I could stay here mm -hmm. forever in silence. And, and that might shock people because a lot of people think I'm an extrovert. Yeah. Actually, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I love the silence. Yeah. Um, and Likewise. And being able to pray, it was like the whole time was just glorious. It just felt like I had this direct can to can line with God. And I, we, he, I think a lot of it was a, a special grace, um, mm -hmm. given my state, uh, mm -hmm. and, and not having had a chance before that moment to do a silent retreat. So I think he was very merciful with me, but mm -hmm. it just felt like this whole time we were, I was pouring my heart out to him and he was just pouring grace and mercy right back into me and, and mm -hmm. addressing, the wounds that I went in there with. It was the most beautiful, glorious experience. And I loved it. I loved the structure Amazing. of the day and um, praying liturgy of the hours and mass and adoration, all of it. So I agree. I, I, I it kind of perplexes me that we're not encouraging our, our children to enter into religious life so often uh, when it's, it's a great gift for them. And honestly for us, cause they're praying for us. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, I was, if, yeah. If you have a, a, ch a child or daughter or son who has that inclination, I mean, um, uh, you're going to get so much benefits from it, grace, grace and otherwise. And um, mm -hmm. Saint Alphonsus recognized he actually do he does have some stern words for for mothers, especially. He does he says he says how is it possible to excuse mothers who expose their daughters to to, to young men, especially who, mm. who have strong feelings for them? And he he says these these women are um, uh, are are daughters. Uh, or he, what does he say here? I'm trying to find a quote. They do not care whether their daughters commit sin. These are the mothers of whom David speaks, whom for the interests of the family immolate their daughters to the devil. So, you know, I think, and there's more quotes in the book about this. I think what he's trying to say, and again, he's writing at a time when, I mean, like modern dating today, like it's totally upside down, right? Oh, um, yeah. Like there's no sense of proper courtship. There, there, no, I spent there, so much time you know I mean? at my boyfriend's house yeah. in high school, like from yeah. the time I was, 14 or 15. I mean, almost every day I was going back to his family's house to hang out. Yeah. And the Lord knows that that was not good for me or my soul. It was, it, it sent me down a very bad path. And, um, I reflect on that often. Um, so yeah, I have to, again, this comports very closely with my own experience. Yeah. Um, and there's so much wisdom and prudence in, in not, allowing your children to do that and to engage in the current modern dating scene as it is. Well, it's just, it's really just pointless um, company keeping. I mean, the, anyone under 20 generally, at least from what I can tell, you're not getting married anytime soon. I mean, the man needs a job. He's got to have income. Um, uh, you know, um, I think so. So personally, I mean, I've done all the many things you did too, Angela in high school and in and, and college and, you know, I went to prom and all these things. I don't think that something to help on this would be at all in favor of. I mean, these are young people having, you know, playtime being adults when they're when there's no marriage in, in sight, generally mm -hmm. speaking. I mean, I mean, when you're together with someone courting the end, the only reason you engage in that, at least you should um, from from everything I've read about the spiritual life. And I think Santa Thomas agrees with this is, is the end is marriage. And, and if there's no potential for that, at least in the future. It, it, you're just it's just an occasion of sin mm -hmm. it's all it's all it is so yeah par parents need i think to be more mindful of that uh, for sure i think there's i think there's an idea that you have to experience multiple kinds of people like try them out kind of to see what you like i remember being told by family members that mm -hmm. when i was when i was dating my now husband um, because i've only formally ever dated like two people there was the guy i dated throughout high school and i met my husband right at the end of my senior year of high school. Um, and then we started dating a few months later, but um, <laughs> which is just wild to me because I, I was 17 when we met. And um, I remember family members that I adored and honestly considered saints telling me, you should be dating around. You should be getting to know people before settling down with someone. And in my mind, I'm mm -hmm. thinking if I'm getting along with this person, and we have the same goals and the same values. We want the same thing in life. What's wrong? Like, why do I need to 
this is a temptation to yeah. for, uh, for dissatisfaction and to yeah. always have your eyes looking um, where they shouldn't be, right? It's like yeah. tearing down the walls of your heart that keep relationships trustworthy and faithful. Um, when yeah. we encourage people to just date around, you know, and, yeah. and have these new experiences, very bad advice. I, that's amazing. I, 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 I hear certain similar situations as well. I mean, it, it's, it's just, even from fairly, you know, um, good Catholics have that same attitude. And I, I, it's just the world creeping in, you know, because mm -hmm. that's just the way things are. And, um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, um, <clears throat> St. Alphonsus does say like what ruin is brought about, uh, by, by, among young people, among bad companions. Oh, it's, and so, yeah. it's, it's so just true. an infectious, infectious air that goes about. And um, this is why he says fathers, especially because fathers at the head of the household mm -hmm. uh, need to inquire into the conduct of their children. Um, and he says you have to remove those occasions. And um, I think at the, at the last thing you said that's really interesting because, um, you know, j just just try other people, you know, check things out. Um, you hear that so often um, when, when a young man or woman um, says, I'm going to the seminary what you often hear is oh you don't want to try a career first or oh you don't want to you go to college first like this like, is lesser than yeah no, yeah don't go because that's the devil wanting to you you to not become a, a, a priest or, or none that's it's just try it out for a little bit it's it's a clear it's it's so obvious what it is when people say that they, they don't always know that mm -hmm. um you know they're, they're trying you know to, to to look out for that person and uh, just to hope they have a good life, but but really, what's behind it is 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 to trying to trip up a vocation. And it's just like, oh, just try the world a little bit, you know. That's really what's going on. But yeah, no, no, don't do it. So I, I'm I'm happy that that's how your um, marriage came about with your your husband. Yeah, I mean, yeah. thanks be to God that later that person called me. Just actually, well, I don't know if she called me, but over the last couple of years, she said that she was grateful that I ignored her terrible advice. <laughs> She said, it, you know, she was she was like, the only time I've given advice and been grateful somebody didn't take it was with yeah. with you and your husband, because yeah. we've built such a beautiful life. And honestly, there were many there were many temptations while we were dating that um, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. am boggled my mind that we are where we are today because God was so faithful when me especially was I was not, you know, um, but I, but my friend Nicholas Cavazos, you may or may not know him, but the traditional Thomist here, he says, does he know about the Transalpine tr Redemptorists? Have you heard of them? Yeah. So the Transalpine Redemptorists are, I believe, off the coast of um, the Orkney Islands and near Scotland, I think, in Scotland. Um, and yeah, they're a traditional um, Redemptorist order. Um, I happen to know uh, Father Alphonsus Maria. He is an also a tr traditional redemptorist priest. Um, I think actually was with the Transalpine Redemptorists at one point. Um, he actually endorsed the back of my book. So um, if you read on the back, you'll see Father Alphonsus's um, endorsement. So he was very kind to me. But uh, hmm. yeah, the redemptorists are interesting. Um, they, they they give missionary uh, three or four day retreats at parishes and usually talk about death, judgment, heaven, hell in their sermons. So it's very, when you have a chance, if you have a redemptorist ever come to your parish for a, a mission, go. So I'm glad, I'm glad uh, he knows about them. Cool. This is really interesting. So we have a comment here that says, Alphonsus Liguori in his writings on hell does a good job showing how evil the Roman Catholic God is. Universalism is the truth. Oh, I mean, do you care to address that? I mean, you don't, you don't have to. I just thought I would throw it up there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. Um, because San Alphonsus wrote a book, uh, a series of, of, of smaller books, compiled into um, a larger book called The Glories of Mary. And it's over 600 uh, pages long. And St. Alphonsus um, has a lot to say about Mary. And I would hope that the, the person who, who wrote that comment would, would actually at least entertain reading what he says. And um, I make the point in the book that um, St. Alphonsus compares Mary to uh, the moon in that she, she's not God. Um, but she reflects the, the brightness of the sun. So we can't look at the sun for long. It's, it's hard, right? The scripture says, no man will see the face of God and live. I think there's some comparisons there. And so the, the moon is, Mary is the moon. She, she reflects God's, God's uh, beauty. Uh, she is, uh, she helps sinners through this world, just as she, I mean, she bore Christ, right? In her womb. There is no human being that was closer to Christ on earth. And so by that proximity, St. Alphonsus argues, uh, 
that would have had to have been a spotless household. In other words, for Christ to live or abide in a uh, womb that was stained by original sin would not make any sense. The creator of the universe, um, God himself, could not live in a polluted environment. Okay, so Mary, by by logic, simple logic, would have to have been spotless. She would she was the immaculate conception. Saint Alphonsus was defending that before the church dogmatically declared that. Um, so if you think about that, um, it, it's interesting because it puts Mary in another light. Uh, she is the vessel. Uh, she complied. She said, yes, I, I will submit my will to God's will. I will um, give my consent to, to being the blessed mother of our Lord. And by that, she warranted to be the mediatrix, right? She Through her womb, Christ came into the world. And in that uh, act, um, she, she merits uh, that role. In other words, she's the one who, who brings Christ into the world. And, and St. Alphonsus actually mentions later on, um, Mary is the one who set Christ off onto his public mission that eventually resulted in his death on Calvary. And you got to think about that for a second. How did she do that? Uh, it was actually at, this, at the Feast of Cana, right? The wedding feast of Cana. Um, Christ had not yet performed a public miracle. So there was not talk about, is this the Messiah yet? And once that happens, once you're performing miracles, people are going to question, they're going to you know, look into more. So Mary at the wedding feast nudges Christ, says, they're out of wine. He says, uh, what, what business is, is it to me? St. Alphonsus says this is on purpose because when Mary asks, she says, you know, they, they need more wine. She's the one who's kind of pushing him towards his public ministry. And he says, okay, I will do this because my mother asked me. Right. Now, if Mary is asking Christ to do something and he says yes in that moment, it's a clear sign of how highly favored she is. And, and she's not just somebody else. Um, she is uh, someone who we can pray to um, and ask for favors. Now, again, Again, this is what Protestants sometimes will get confused on, um, and just non-Catholics in general. Um, you know, Scripture says there is no other way to God the Father except through Christ, and that's true. But Mary, Saint Alphonsus says, can also be our mediator to Christ, just as Christ is with the Father. So if we seek out Mary, who, who more than any other creature in the world, again, Angela, she bore him in his womb. Okay. Um, she was there at the foot of the cross when all the other apostles except John were not there. Mm -hmm. Okay, she she was given particular graces to go through all that. Can um, I add to that? Yes. Even as profound as all of that is, the very cells of our Lord continue to exist within her body through this scientific phenomenon of microchimerism. Have you ever heard of it? It's the it's this biological symbiotic occurrence that happens between a mother and her child where they exchange cells mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the child's stem cells actually help heal cells in the mother's body when mm -hmm. things are off and, and, and vice versa. And so what happens is that those cells remain in a mother for mm -hmm. a very long time after the child is born. Some would say for the rest of their life, but they're not exactly sure how long those cells remain. And so you think of that and Our Lady has the very cells of our Lord still permeating throughout her body. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, that's the thing is, um, there's such a belittling and hatred of Mary in these times, and um, sometimes it's, it's it's ignorant, sometimes it's intentional. Either either way, it's of the devil because Mary undoes Lucifer's "I will not serve." She says, "I will serve," mm -hmm. and um, so she she is our mother. I mean, Christ Himself said at the at the at the foot of, at the cross, he says to John, "Behold your mother," and so Mary, in that moment, Saint Alphonsus says, becomes our our spiritual mother. Um, and he says to Mary, "Woman, behold your son." In that moment, uh, she adopts all of us, Saint Alphonsus says, as her spiritual sons. So Mary did not have other children. Okay, she has other children spiritually, but not through her body, as as, mm -hmm. as you're alluding to. So, um, you know, there's. An important distinction there to, to make uh, about um, the uniqueness of, of Jesus Christ, his message, his, his doctrines, his, his teachings on Mary and, and our duty in responding to that. So, um, uh, yeah, I, universalism, I mean, Christ, the, Christ, there's only a couple of options about who Christ was. He, either he was a liar, um, he was insane, or he was the son of God. He, he was who he said he was. And there's no way in my mind, because I, I come up with this, 
against this with, with some former Catholic friends of mine who have fallen away from the faith. You know, they'll say Jesus never existed. You know, the Bible is just a, a, a forgery. Wow. I mean, what That's sort amazing. of, there's no human intellect or, or grouping of human intellects together that could, that could, could come up with all the parallels uh, between the Old and New Testament, you know, the things that were put in that were left out um, with the traditions in the church. That it's not a, a natural, there's no way a natural mind of its own volition can come up with any of this stuff, um, mm -hmm. not let alone altogether. So, um, yeah, I think it's But this problem with universalism, it doesn't even comport with what our Lord has said in sacred scripture. I think of Matthew 7, where he says, Many will say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, Get away from me, for I never knew you. Um, and how often our Lord talks about separating the sheep from the goats. I mean, it, the, he says the, the path is narrow. I mean, there are so many instances in sacred scripture where Jesus Christ, if he is who he says he is and what he says is true because by, by the fact of, the, of his very nature being God, um, then we have to accept whether we like it or not, that universalism is not true because Christ himself said it repeatedly that it is yeah. not true. Well, he, he also said, uh, that's, that's a great explanation and a, an amazing defense. Um, he also said, those who do not have the bread of life in them do not have the bread of life in them. And, and you're, 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 not, you're not alive. He says, those who, I am the, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who lives in me will have eternal life. Yeah, so there's so many things yeah. here that, that, that go against. It's just such um, a silly, honestly, I'm not trying to be mean, uh, man, 1163. But it, I mean, it's just. That's not what Jesus says. And like we, sure, it seems, it seems like a really nice idea. It's a nice idea. It makes us feel good to think that everyone at the end of time will be saved. Um, but that's our own emotions. That's not, that does not comport with what sacred scripture says or the, the longstanding teachings and tradition of the church. Um, that I just, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm sorry that it's, it's just not true. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to address that comment um, before we, we continued on. Um, I would love to hear any of your, your last minute thoughts about, um, you know, maybe even the Eucharist, the devil, um, because, it, yeah, I think we've touched a little bit on, on Satan, but what does St. Alphonse have to say about the devil? Yeah, that, well, one, um, he, he, he knows, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier or not. We were talking about sin, I think. Um, the devil wants nothing more than to have us think uh, exactly, unfortunately, like what the um, commenter said, that um, it doesn't matter how many times we sin. It doesn't matter if, um, you know, we, we our plan. Like he wants us to plan that our conversion is going to happen on our, on our deathbed. John Paul just says, those who live in sin will die in sin nearly hardly anyone who lives their life in sin um, will have a conversion on their deathbed because that's how they lived, how you, how you will die. And so um, the chapter on sin, I think is most pertinent to what Santa Fonda says about the devil, that he knows he can't trip us up. Um, some of us, so, some people, I mean, I, uh, I need to humble myself um, immediately to the point where he wants us to oftentimes in a second. I mean, most people aren't just going to jump from one instance to a okay, to mortal sin just in mm -hmm. five seconds. What he'll do is pr try to have you indulge in things that might lead you to that later. So, you know, if you're um, <clears throat> if you're an alcoholic or something, and you know it always ends badly, um, it could just be something as innocent as um, a get together somewhere with friends for a dinner or something, and you might have to just say no to that because you know it's it's. You, you, those times in the past, you've done things like that and what it's resulted in. Um, but so, so St. Alphonse's point is the devil <clears throat> first pulls out a thread, then makes it a chain, then makes it, uh, I forget the next one, but it basically it's a snowball effect that he's going to tempt us with certain venial sins, occasions of sins, and then eventually get us to the point where we're in complete darkness. So, mm -hmm. so the devil wants to blind us to our sins and to... Um, uh, dull our senses to the evil we commit. So um, he has more to say about that. I think um, he wants us to be prideful, um, to resist suffering. And it's a lot of it's, it's sort of implicit in, in other things we've talked about, but 
Um, yeah. It's a frightening thing uh, at times, especially our death. I mean, you've read, you've read his book on death. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a death great the book. Summer. It's a great Lenten yeah. read. You sh- everyone yeah. should read it one Lent, you know, go yeah. through it a little bit every day because there are a lot of things. You read it, you read a section of it and you put it down and you're going, oh my goodness, this is me or this has been me. Um, I totally see what he is saying here. And then that instantaneous desire to repent <laughs> <laughs> it is so visceral, I think, because you just see it so clearly. He does. So, he's so illustrative in mm-hmm. in explaining these concepts. Like you said, it's anybody could understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think that's the summary of Stand Up Honest in a nutshell. I mean, to to close out the interview today is yeah. he's very uh, practical. He's very simple to read, uh, and and I think I think my book is as well. And um, like like you said, I wanted to help uh, represent his his ideas. I'm not changing anything. Um, and I, I don't want people to have the impression I'm uh, committing some sort of uh, aggiornamento or, you know, returning and updating things. Mm. Um, it's a simple application of the thousands of pages that he's written um, and, and trying to distill that to the modern reader who, again, doesn't have time. So there's an audio book coming out soon. So check that back oh, on Amazon. Awesome. The book's available for Amazon at the That's moment. Great. Um, I know that everybody wants to buy on Amazon, but um, please do that. Or you can contact me at stpeterspress.proton, uh, at proton.me. So I, that's my imprint. Um, awesome. So you can do that. And yeah, the audio book, if that's easier for you, it'll be out very soon. And I see that you also have it on Kindle as well. So you can get a paperback, Kindle, and on audio soon. Um, that's really awesome. So thank you for coming on today. I hope everybody goes and buys your book. It was just published on September, September 12th was when it, when it came out. Um, so everybody go buy it. And, uh, I really hope to have you back on. You're just as, as my friend Nicholas here said, you just, he, well, he said that you are a Chad. <laughs> <laughs> so all all the praises for Stephen Cox. You guys go check out his work at LifeSite News as well. Um, really good human being, and we're so grateful for your time today. Thank you for coming on, Angela. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to do this again. 